just wonderful. It's just wonderful to be here and to see all of you folks here. Uh, each four years when we do these symposia, uh, one of the best things for me is to just become reacquainted with so many old friends, uh, old friends and students and colleagues and former uh, technicians that work for me and just everybody that I see in the other in the conferences all these other years. It's just that's that's the big thing for me is just seeing everybody. Uh, well, and I, I'm going to point out someone in particular because I haven't seen him in many, many, many years, but he was my very first graduate student working on holes. Uh, you, all, you all know the name uh, Dr. Steve Fritz. Steve was the person who was in charge of putting holes uh, into Yellowstone National Park. And uh, he, along with uh, Carter Niemeyer, who is here incidentally, the, the, probably the biggest guy here in the you probably see him walking around, but but uh, he and Carter were the ones that actually got the wolves and, and sent them to Yellowstone Park. Uh, Carter's and, and here, he should stand. I'm sorry? <laughs> Carter's here, he should stand up. Stand. Yes, please. And yes. Stand. Yes. Stand. Yes. Stand. <laughs> He was a very good uh, graduate student, my PhD student, finished a, a really good project, and uh, when he finished, uh, it turned out there was a position that I had available uh, to hire a really good wolf biologist, and not so obviously uh, we hired Steve, and it was to start and run the wolf depredation program, uh, wolf depredation control program in Minnesota, and so Steve uh, was assigned to that program, did an excellent job on it, and worked in it for several years. Diane Boyd worked at, uh, on the project for a while, and, and after a while, eventually, John Hart, who's in the room, took over, and that program was still going, and it's basically the same way Steve set it up, uh, the same uh, regulations and that type of thing. So it was a very successful program. But after a few years um, on that program, um, it turned out that I was offered a new position. Uh, actually, I was offered the position to take over my supervisor's role, who was uh, the, um, essentially the director of the endangered species research uh, for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And that position would have uh, entailed being uh, uh, in charge of not just wolf uh, conservation and education and, and uh, research and all, but all the endangered species, California condor, the Kirkland's warbler, Puerto Rican parrot, all of those. But I didn't want that job. I, I was content with working with wolves, and I thought, well, I wonder if Steve might like that job. And I recommended him for it, and he did. He said, I, I'd like to move up and work with these other species, and he did that. So that was wonderful, but it turned out then that he, the tables kind of turned because I had been his supervisor for several years, and all of a sudden, he was my supervisor. Now, he did a good job supervising, no problem, but there was a little hitch there, because he and I had worked on a, on a paper together, and um, with, the, with the government, when you do a, an article or a paper like this to publish, you first have to get government approval for that paper to publish it. So this, the standard approach is you turn the paper over to the government, they s spend months on it and finding out whether you know, all your T's are crossed and all that stuff, and then you get approval to submit it for publication. But that's a long process. It was at that time, several months. And the publication process was also long. <coughs> you submit it to a journal, they send it to some reviewers, it takes months and months to get it back. So sometimes, some of us would have had a little workaround. That's called a workaround. Anyway, we would send the article to the journal at the same time we send it to the government for approval. And that usually worked pretty well because while the government was working to approve it, so was the journal working to approve it. To approve it. And usually by the time it got accepted for publication, you had government approval. Well, it turned out that on this paper that Steve and I co-authored, 
uh, tables turned on that. It got accepted by the journal before the government had approved it. That's a little bit of a problem. <laughs> and someone told us. <laughs> so that, Steve, that put Steve in a rather awkward position because as my supervisor, he had to write me a letter of reprimand. <laughs> Trouble is, he was a co-author on this. <laughs> so I got this letter from the man, and I framed it. <laughs> and it sits at all my office. All my best in the office now. <laughs> anyway. Those were the days, Steve. <laughs> anyway, our charge today, and our the charge to you me to speak today, we're supposed to kind of give a, a personal introduction to, to uh, how, or, or our personal introduction to how we got into wolf work and, and what, what it was like at the time, what, is, what the status of wolves was at the time, and, and those kind of things. And, um, so this is what you're gonna see now. You know, each of us, kind of, we, we don't necessarily like talking about ourselves, and, I got an idea not long ago that maybe what we should do is Luigi give me his talk, and I do that, and he give my talk, you know? but, but it turns out that I didn't have that idea in time, so. <laughs> well, I used to be young. <laughs> I mean, that was a long time ago. But anyway, I used to be young, and I, I have been given instructions on how to run these things. What do I do to make this the first thing? Do I just push a, like a um, arrow? arrow? Yep. Okay, there we go. We can, I can do that. I can find that arrow. I'm not taking a tech here, but anyway, I don't know what an arrow looks like. So, when I was young, I was raised in a family that did a, a lot of outdoor things hunting and fishing and, and uh, camping, picking berries, picking hickory nuts, uh, mushrooms, the whole works. And so it was pretty natural for me to become uh, interested in doing, having a career in the outdoors, really. And um, so that's kind of how it, uh, it all started out. In terms of the way things were relative to wolves at that time, there, there weren't very many wolves around. We'll go into that a little later. But the point is, at that time, wolves were not looked upon very uh, kindly. They were kind of viewed, uh, what else? They were kind of viewed like this. And uh, that was that was what, the way the public looked. Not necessarily the way I did, but the way the public looked. And um, they were being they were being uh, poisoned. Let me think that one. They were being poisoned, shot through the air, uh, and um, and there was a bounty on them in Minnesota, uh, where the, the, at that time they were mostly in Minnesota, and there was a bounty on them that. Uh, with today in today's money uh, worth about three hundred and thirty dollars. It was thirty-five dollars at the time. But anyway, uh, there was that and so the only wolves left in the forty-eight states by that time was in basically northeastern Minnesota and a few little bits of a few packs here and there in northern Wisconsin and, and northern Michigan. Uh, but that was pretty much for it. Uh, it for the 48 states. And the reason that they were living still in Minnesota at that time is that we had the southern tip of the whole Canadian population because they were still uh, in good shape at that time. And a lot of good, a lot of wolves. And, and just north of Minnesota was quite a, quite a cool provincial park and um, wilderness area. So the, the Minnesota tip of the, of the whole population uh, was, that's the reason that they weren't wiped out. Now, also, you'll see up there uh, Iowa Oil National Park, because there were wolves in that park starting in 1949. They come over across from Papa Canada. And um, that became a, a kind of a real uh, special area in terms of wolves. And so we'll take a little closer look at that. that that's a 2,000 tenths square mile uh, island in Lake Superior. Uh, it's 45 miles long, nine miles wide at its widest point. And um, there was uh, something really special about that island because they had, it had wolves and moose, and in fact, and beavers. And that was pretty much it as far as wolf food was concerned 
the wolves there lived on moose and beavers. And um, so it was an interesting park, an interesting island, and it was a national park. And it turns out that a fellow by the name of Durward Allen, uh, Durward Allen was a professor at Purdue University, and he was interested in these wolves, and he got a grant to study the wolves and the moose on Isle Royale. And this was a big thing because there weren't just that many wolf studies being done at the time. And so he asked me to do that study as a grad student. I was young then too. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I began that study in 1958. And the basic, uh, most of the data collected there, we collected with an aircraft, following wolves around in the snow during winter and watching them, whatever they did. And of course, mostly what they did is hunt to find something they could eat, which happened to be moose. Beavers were a lot below, below the ice at that time. So they fed on these moose. And one of the things we found, uh, and this picture is fairly typical of it, is that they really couldn't just kill any moose they wanted to, uh, even though there were 15 wolves in the pack. And most people at that time thought wolves could just, if you can get a pack of wolves, could wipe out anything they came to. We found out it couldn't. In fact, uh, one of the major findings was that their success rate in winter was basically somewhere around 7%. That is about 7% of the times that they tried to catch a moose, were they able to? So that was a big thing. That was a big finding, and it kind of changed the way a lot of people looked at wolves. Now, just about the same time, by coincidence, it had nothing to do with what we were doing, but just about the same time, there was a very prominent and popular uh, book published by Rachel Carson called Silent Spring. This had nothing to do with wolves, but this had to do with pesticides. And the fact that DDT and, and the pesticides we, we were using were terrible on some wildlife, particularly bald eagles and peregrine falcons, etc. That that book made a huge hit. That that turned the public around. That was a very popular book and turned the public around when it came to thinking about the environment. Started thinking, boy, we better start paying attention to the environment. And this was all before Earth Day, so that was this. In fact, was one of the one of the prompts for for Earth Day. At the same time, we published our article uh, in about the wolves and moose on our well, our studies of them uh, in National Geographic, and that made a big hit. So here you had Rachel Carson's book. Better take a closer look at the environment. We had this article coming out that these wolves really can't kill just anything they want to. And um, so maybe they're not so bad as we think. And another coincidence, and this had nothing to do with wolves, nor did it have anything to do with Silent Spring, but it was a, it was very uh, important from a research standpoint, is the advent of radio tracking. That, the first article was 1963. Until that time, all we could do to study the movements of an animal touches and put a tear tag in it, and then if somebody caught him some other time or died or was hit by a car so far, we know too late where the animal was. And that was what we learned about about animal movement. When radios uh, came were developed, uh you all know the story you know, you can follow it and set it down and So anyway, so that was a huge factor. So these things just by chance coming into into play. And uh, eventually the wolf body was removed in 1965 in Minnesota. So things were starting to change. And then in 1966, the Endangered Species Conservation Act of 1966 was passed. And most people don't know about this act. Most people think of the Endangered Species Act as the act that was published in 1973, the Endangered Species Act. That's the one that protected them. This one didn't protect the wolves or any kind of this endangered species. It just said they are out there and said the government should start paying attention to them, particularly government agencies should pay more attention to these endangered animals and enlisted them. It said these are the ones we think are endangered, one of which was the wolf. Okay? So all that came together. We had a silent spring from one stream. 
the National Geographic article, radio tracking, and the Endangered Species Conservation Act, or Preservation Act, and you put them all together in, in this kind of a big um, grouping, and it was natural that well, somebody would come out there and start putting radios on wolves. Well, I happen to be the right person for that because I've been working with radio tracking for three years uh, in, in developing some of the, uh, not, not, not the uh, actual components of the collars and that kind of thing, but how do you, how do you put these things on animals, how do you keep them on animals, and that kind of thing. So it was just natural that I should turn to putting radios on wolves. And so we started a study in, in northeastern Minnesota in the Superior National Forest, uh, radio tracking wolves and deer. And uh, we, we carried out that study until actually uh, late August, or early August this year. That's when the study finally closed down. And uh, so during that time, this was a lot of years now. I, I wasn't quite so young either. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and during those years, for many times, I had several graduate students, but also had uh, many volunteer wildlife technicians. Actually, I had four wildlife technicians every three months, so that makes 16 a year. Some of them are in here in this room, yeah. Uh, 16 a year, and you can imagine how many that is over all these years, along with a bunch of graduate students. And that counts for something, as I'll point out in a, in a bit. The other thing that happened then, and that is Earth Day. Earth Day was the, suddenly in 1970, we started Earth Day, and I consider that the point that I call the environmental revolution. That's when so the public in general started thinking about the environment really seriously. It was a result of some of the things I pointed out there. Hey Dave, can you move the microphone more center on you? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. this one. Yeah. Boy, did, uh, I'm sure that's better, but <laughs> did, did you guys in the back miss all that stuff? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry, and thank you for pointing this out. <laughs> so the other thing that happened in 1970 is I published a book. Uh, you, you folks probably know that book, The, the Wolf, the Ecology and Behavior and Endangered Species. And it turned out that book has been in print uh, uh, for 50, 52 years. It, it, I finally got it out of print this year. Uh, and I did that because what I wrote well, I wrote that in 1968, but it was published in 70. But um, uh, uh, because it was written so long ago, obviously it's not necessarily correct now in so many ways. And so I had to, you know, I was constantly trying to, to um, answer questions that were why that, why what I said in 1968 wasn't right in 1998. So anyway, got it out of print. But it also was um, uh, republished in paperback. And it got a wide, it got wide reading. Uh, <laughs> so it was really, and I don't know how, I don't know what the circulation was, but it was, it was huge. So that had quite an effect. And then uh, in 1973, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, and at that time it was Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources, started the most specialist group. Douglas Pinlock started that at the time in 1973. That's when I met my friend Luigi. Uh, he was, he, we, we, this was in Stockholm at a big conference and Doug Pinlock started this group. And then um, when, when Doug passed away in 1978, I became chair and chaired it to, to um, 2013. And when the Wolf Specialist Group was folded into the Canid Specialist Group, they, just because that's what they did with IUCN. So anyway, um, that had a, quite an effect across the world in terms of, of wolves. Now, let's go back to Durham because he started all this, you recall, with Isle Royal. And um, uh, just a little kind of a, a synthesis here. Uh, he actually launched me by uh, 1962, and by 1975, he was ready to retire. And he launched Rolf Peterson at that time. As his, I was Durbert's first graduate student. Rolf Peterson was Durbert's last graduate student. And Rolf took over the project. And when he did, 
then he had followers, uh, uh, assistants and all, who took over uh, after he did. Uh, you see there Joe, Joe Bump and Sarah Hoy and, and John Vustich. And I should mention Doug Smith uh, worked with, with um, Rolf on Iowa Oil for, for a while and then came on our project in northeastern Minnesota. But anyway, so Durward, had, Durward sort of was the founder of all of uh, these folks. And, uh, and then Dave Meach uh, had some followers because he had 16 <laughs> volunteers every year and a bunch of grad students. And so there's some names here that you might recognize uh, that worked on our project, either as graduate students or as technicians. And I counted up, and of all of these folks, at least 10 of them are in the room today. did not come through our program, but he was very uh, influential in catching these wolves in, in Canada. And those wolves, uh, uh, they darted them from the air, and uh, I, we could have, Carter could tell you all kinds of stories about wading through the snow, chest deep with the wolf on his back, trying to get back to the helicopter, and I mean, it goes on and on. Steve could tell you all kinds of stories, but we don't have time for that today. But anyway, those wolves got accumulated in, in Canada, and eventually put on a plane and shipped down the Yellowstone and released in the Yellowstone Park. And the result of all that, and it was not just Yellowstone, but also, also Central Idaho. At the same time, wolves were released both places. And here we are today. This is the, this is the distribution of wolves uh, in the 48 states today uh, as a result of the recovery in northeastern Minnesota, where wolves moved over into Wisconsin and Michigan, and um, the reintroduction into uh, basically Yellowstone Park and central Idaho resulted in what you see uh, in the Northwest, including, and you've heard a lot of this at the symposium today, uh, this week. And uh, there's, there's a special one here um, in Colorado. Some wolves actually got into Colorado uh, that upper that upper dot in Colorado is a pack of wolves that have moved in themselves. Uh, they recolonized naturally from Wyoming. The other, the southern dot is is not. It's in question. Um, just um, just a week or so ago, a couple of weeks now, I guess, uh, a whole bunch of cattle were found that uh, at least um, the Colorado Department of Fish and Game looked at them and um, thought they were, they looked like they had been killed by wolves. But so far as I know, and there are some folks here today, and if I'm wrong, um, let me know, but so far as I know, they have not yet found the tracks or the scants of, uh, of wolves there are, or pictures. So we're not certain about that, that southern pack, but there could be a southern pack there. Uh, in any case, as you probably know and have heard at the conference, uh, that by next year, or sometime in 2023, there is supposed to be, the Colorado is supposed to reintroduce wolves to, to the state. So that's going to be, uh, that's going to actually be recolonized as well. And, um, and from there, who knows, they may go into Nevada or Utah, and, and they will anyway, sooner or later, from Idaho or Montana, but, but whatever. They're going to keep spreading out throughout the, uh, throughout the west there. And uh, when they do, there's going to be livestock losses. I mean, that's, that's just part of when wolves recolonize places, whether it be here or Europe or what. And um, when, they, when that happens, you're going to get reports like this. They may or may not be true, but these reports are going to be made. These, this is just from Google Alerts uh, a week ago. You see the date up there. And um, so, it's going to become a controversy and a problem, and it's something we have to face because there's humans involved as well. When wolves kill their livestock, they don't like it. And, um, and this, is, this is a reason. This is someone uh, who's pining over one of the calves that they found dead, and she thinks the wolves killed it. So she's upset with that. What that means is, though, is that 
it, it seems to me that in the future of wolf research, and that's what I've been asked to, to close with, is what do you think the future of wolf research is? I think the future of wolf research is here. That we're going to need to do far more work trying to figure out how can we live with the wolves that are now recolonizing so many places. And um, one of the ways is to have conferences like this where we speak about it and we talk to each other about it, we plan and we make plans and, and uh, we hopefully do more research. Here's the kind of research I would like to see much more of. This is research on, on not on the wolves, but on the cattle, uh, the livestock, what's happening with them uh, when, when wolves uh, are, are attacking them. Um, there's, there's all kinds of new research that could be done and hopefully at some point we come up with something that will help us figure out the best way of, of um, allowing wolves to live with humans. So I'm pretty much done with that presentation and I see I have a minute left. So I'll try to use that minute now. I have a little reputation for some sometime when I close my talks uh, because long ago I used to close them with a little, little story. Um, it turned out that one time when we were live trapping, uh, we were live trapping deer, we had a deer trap out across a frozen river. But one night the weather changed and the, and the whole river opened. And to get to that trap, uh, I was going to have to wade across the river. And uh, I didn't know that until I got there. And the old trapper I had with me said, well, Dave, he said, you know, if I were your age, I, I was still a little younger then. Uh, <laughs> if I were your age, I would have just, uh, my, I would just take my pants off, put them around my neck, and wade it across, and then you get on the other side, put your pants back on, and close the trap, and do the same, and come back. So I had to do that. I mean, somebody had to do that, and I was in charge of projects. So I <laughs> took my pants off, put them around my neck, started across the river, and. Uh, the, my reputation is that I used to end my talks with that slide that somebody took as I was crossing the river. <laughs> because, because I would then use that to say, okay, and this is the end of my tale. <laughs> but, but I can't do that now. That, that's politically incorrect. So <laughs> don't, don't worry. In its place, so I want to tell you a little story about the Ouija game. <laughs> Ellesmere, up way, way up north. Uh, <laughs> way up north, okay? So I, I think you folks know, or many of you know, that there were tame, there's tame wolves up there, and I was able to actually live with them for 25 summers. And uh, several of the people in the room here, Walter, Nancy Gibson, uh, Mary, Mary, uh, Mary Ortiz, uh, Mary Mall, and uh, Luigi, many people were up there with me and uh, as, as partners uh, each of these different summers. And in 1990, Luigi was up there with me. And, we, and, and along with the graduate student, here we are, here they are at a uh, Muscox carcass. And um, so, you know, we enjoyed ourselves up there and all, and, and uh, following moles around. And we, we followed them on ATVs, four-wheel uh, four vehicles and one three-wheeler actually we had. And um, we had, and it turned out that year, that the three members of the wolf pack had only one pup. And we call that pup Super Pup, you remember that? And uh, we called it Super Pup because uh, that darn thing traveled to a rendezvous site when it was six weeks old, 30 kilometers. 30 kilometers. And we followed on our ATVs, right? Here we go. I can't see that. Is it, <laughs> <laughs> is it going to the running yeah. site? Yes. Has <laughs> it gotten here yet? <laughs> oh, wait, I have it here. I'm sorry. Technology. <laughs> okay, so it got to the running site. Now it makes suspense because of this arrow that I've been pushing each time worked until now. <laughs> what do I do to make it continue to work? No. Okay, here we go. I got to the running site. Okay. It, took, it took a day and a half or so to follow his and went to the running site. Now there was a catch here because at that time, Luigi, within a day or two, was scheduled to catch a flight out of, 
out there in the upper left, you'll see Eureka, that's where there's a weather station and a big dirt strip where every now and then an airplane lands. So it's not a, it's a no schedule flight or anything, but, but there was one we knew was coming in and Luigi was gonna to have to catch that so that he could get down to a place where there are scheduled flights because he had reservations to go back to Rome. And so we had to get him back there. Regarding, and we had to leave the bulls to do that. So we started up. Remember those moments? <laughs> <laughs> so off we go. Now on the way we had crossed, on the way over we had crossed this river. It's called the Slidery River. You see where it comes from the east and goes off to the west into Slidery Fjord. That fjord is four miles across. And the river, it, it, it's, it's, it's fairly narrow, or it was narrow when we came over it. It just turned out that we didn't realize that that river was tidal. Because it's, it's hooked to the Arctic Ocean right there. And when we got to where we were going to try to cross it, to get back, to get Luigi back, this is what we found. <laughs> So now we had to figure out how in the world we're going to get Luigi back. You know? So we up and down the river, we, we zipped and around trying to find the narrowest spot and, uh, and, and uh, places where we might be able to might be able to cross. And um, there was a place you know, this was it, and, and it was uh, it was uh, a long uh, flats where we could drive part of it. But then there was about a 15 foot stretch that we had to wait. And, and it was up to our chest. And I mean, we had to, you know, we had to sight this out before we ever took the, the machines out. So we realized we're going to have to carry these machines across this river. And so we stripped everything off the back. We had tents and sleeping bags and all that but attached to the back. We carried them over to them on the other shore. And then each of the three of us grabbed one machine and started carrying it across that river. Now, I don't have a shot of us carrying across the river. I really wish we had someone else there to film it. It would have been great. But we managed. We, we had to hold it up, up so the electrical parts were above the water. And uh, those are heavy machines. And But we did. We made it across. And there, there's, there we are landing and all, and pulled our pants up and all. And, uh, <laughs> but I decided to, uh, as long as I was wet, that they're soaking wet, to, to what the heck, take a little swim in the ocean, you know? So, <laughs> so I did. So this is the best you're gonna get now. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's not the end of my tale. <laughs> Thank you very much.